Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Very good. Hi. Welcome to Dr. Pomerantz Remembers. Uh, thank you all for being here and for joining us for what I'm sure will be a really interesting hour um, speaking with the president and hearing him tell stories about Western U. My name is Jeff Keating. I'm the Executive Director of Public Affairs and Marketing. And I want to very quickly acknowledge um, the fact that this whole idea was the brainchild of uh, three people in our IT department, notably Michael Bradford, Miari Andrea Miriosa, and Ann Amsler. And they are here helping us carry it out today. So a round of applause for them, please. We want to get right to it, so please allow me to uh, introduce Dr. Stephanie Bolin, who is our interviewer today. Dr. Bolin is one of Western U's strongest and proudest advocates. She joined us in May 1990 as an instructor and now is Dean of the College of Allied Health Professions, which includes the Departments of Health Sciences Education, Physician Assistant Education, and Physical Therapy Education. So she is celebrating her 25th year at Western U. How about that? Uh, is that right? Dr. Bolin holds a doctorate in educational leadership from the University of Laverne, a master's degree in health professions education from our own College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific, so she's also an alum, and is a graduate of the Charles R. Drew University Physician Assistant Program. As a PA, her specialty is pediatrics, and her research interests include educational leadership, outcomes assessment, and program review. But today, she's going to be asking questions of our own Dr. Pomerantz, and we thank him for being here as well. Take it away, Dr. Bolin, thank you. First, I just want to thank Dr. Pomeranz for allowing me to ride his vision for 25 years. It's been an exciting ride. And like Jeff said, we're going to jump right into it. So Dr. P, our first question that the audience wants to know is, on Labor Day, 1977, you appeared here on campus. You had no buildings, which meant no classrooms. You had no faculty, no students, little money. Tell us what that first day was like. <laughs> You want me to remember all of that. Uh, so. <laughs> that was an interesting period of time in, uh, in my life, in the life of uh, Harriet, our family. Can you imagine all the things you just mentioned? Uh, we didn't have. I had everything. I had everything but the real thing. I was, I was a president of no college. <laughs> I looked at the, the world out there in front of me and uh, considered the opportunities that I had. I was recruited by a group of osteopathic leaders here who uh, wanted me to build a, a college of osteopathic medicine. And a couple of things flipped through my head when I considered that. One was theater. You know, could I really do this? Absolutely. Uh, the, the other was trust. If I came up with an idea, would the board, those people who constituted the board, uh, would they trust me? If I said, let's build uh, a medical school that was based upon compassion and caring, would they believe that? Well, these are the questions that, uh, that I had. And I must say, I was uh, uh, in a very scary period of time in my life. Uh, consider this, we had, Harriet and I had a beautiful home in, outside of Chicago, I had a wonderful position. I was the executive uh, director of education for the American Osteopathic Association. And uh, I had this opportunity thrown in my direction. And the trick also was, could I do it? Did I have the strength to do it? Did I have the, um, the skill to do it? Was my philosophy good enough? Those were the things that ran through my, my head. And if I came out here in 1977, uh, would I have the resources necessary to fill in the blank, uh, to uh, uh, raise the funds, raise the support. Could we do that? Was I willing to be able to uh, give up a very good job? Was I willing to sell a, a very beautiful home? Was I willing to take my kids out of school to come out here? Because that was the critical time that 
during your high school uh, kids? Well, I went to the, the, uh, the one source of the answers to those questions, and I'm sure you've guessed who that would be. <laughs> That's Harriet, my wife. Yeah. Uh, she's the one who said, you can do it. If you feel it's doable, then I'll stand behind you. And you know, there are a lot of men who face that situation who don't have the support from, you know, the critical part of your life. And uh, because of her support and her trust, her faith in me, uh, we went ahead and made the decision to, to, uh, to come here. And that itself was very scary. But I finally agreed uh, to take the position. Jump ahead a couple of uh, months. We're on the airplane, United Airplane, United Airlines, flying from Chicago to uh, Los Angeles. And I'm sitting uh, in my seat. My kids are surrounding me. My wife was there. It's quiet with all the noise from the, the, the engines. And I'm thinking, you know, you've got to be crazy. You, you, told them, <laughs> you told them you could do all of these things. And I said to myself, yeah, but my wife said I could do it. It's always a good woman in the kitchen. Right. So, uh, and I'm sitting in the, my seat, and the plane's taking off like this. And I'm leaning back in the seat, and I'm thinking, what the hell have you done? <laughs> Supposing this doesn't work. Well, I quickly dropped that idea that it didn't work. In fact, it's important if you're engaged in some kind of an exercise like that, career building and the significance of what you're doing with others, you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. Somebody once asked me not too long ago, what, were, what was the biggest what was the biggest challenge you've had so far at that point, mm -hmm. back in 1970? What's the biggest challenge? And uh, what was the most important term that I learned at that time? And I think it was uh, fear. Fear was the biggest concern I had. And, and I, I overcame fear by believing in what I was doing was the right thing. And, and let me tell you about the, the, the right thing, because I always believed this as an educator, as a teacher. The, um, the idea of educating historians or philosophers or physicians always has to be based upon a point of view, a philosophy, a core value. And I felt that, that back in those days, in, those days sounds like the days of yesteryear when the Lone Ranger came riding out of the river. But uh, I believed it was important to stay with my belief. Even though people were telling me I couldn't do it, I had to believe that I could do it. And, and that belief also came from my wife. She insisted that I pursue this. You know, speaking of knowing you could do it, it reminds me of a funny story. They asked uh, two favorite stories that you tell. And you have to indulge me in the audience with one of the one about the unplugged telephone as it relates to the facilities that you did not have. Can you share that story with me in the audience? Well, back in uh, the, the early uh, 1977, we just had a little rented room across the street uh, and a desk and a secretary, and, and Harriet served as the secretary. Uh, the, all of the electronics weren't set up at that time. We've had none of these things uh, existed for me at that point. Right. Uh, one day, a man came into the, the office, and I said to myself, ah, this is a prospector. Maybe he could help me raise a lot of money. So he came in, and I said, could I help you, sir? He said, uh, uh, yes, you can. I'm here to set up your telephones. And here I'm after him. I'm trying to get him to give some philanthropy. Yes. <laughs> Technology is so needed. Right. What was the other, what's the other story that you remember? Well, I'm going to save that one for a little bit later because oh, okay. it's That's going to crack a... everybody up. <laughs> well, my wife is not here, so I'll get away with it. Yeah, you will get away with it, but I'll, I'll let her know. 
you know, my next question deals with the big term osteopathic medicine. What was your connection to osteopathic medicine and why osteopathic medicine? Way back in those days, uh, osteopathic medicine was not very well known. I didn't know what it was. It was a big secret uh, for me. But then I had the, the, the privilege of meeting a number of osteopathic physicians. And I got to learn their philosophy, their core values. And the core value of an osteopathic physician was caring and compassion. And that was very important, that the doctor actually talks with the patient, communicates, touches the patient. All of those things were very important. I learned it uh, by working with these uh, osteopathic physicians. And then I was hooked on the idea. And it was very important that I pursue the idea of a healer having the compassion to heal. And that was critical. I said, this is, I have to build this into this college that we're developing. It's got to be part of the curriculum. And more importantly, it's got to be imbued in the faculty. Now, that humanistic point of view uh, has got to be there. It's important that it's there. Not only for the faculty, the students, the custodians, the support staff, everybody has to believe in the, that core value to make it uh, distinctive. Uh, you know, education, I felt, uh, and I was correct, you know, it was not just based upon uh, the, the, uh, the technical and scientific aspects of uh, healing, uh, but education for at least healers has to, has to be uh, based upon the humanistic aspect of, uh, of things. And I endeavored to build that into the curriculum and more importantly, to hire people who believed it and could fulfill that. That's the key. Surround yourself with people who believe your philosophy. You know, that statement ties nicely into um, to, teach, to, to teach to heal together. How did you come up with that motto, and what does each word specifically mean? Well, to teach to heal together, it seemed to really uh, encompass this, this whole uh, philosophy that I brought here. Uh, and by the way, I didn't admit it. It was a, a belief that existed for years in uh, ecclesiastical circles, and education, and uh, so forth. Uh, it just seemed to make sense to teach, uh, which would then lead to healing, and together. I think it's important that we all became uh, involved with our educational process. We were teammates. And as it turns out, a number of years later, uh, which was 19, when did we become a university? In 1996. And then when we entered these three new schools, it was based upon the idea that, the, that uh, we worked together as a team. There was an interprofessional nature to what we were doing. So it just made sense to be able to have that uh, statement coined, really. I don't think I really coined it, but it was something that I picked up on. And it, uh, it made a lot of sense about what we were doing and what we would continue to do. I'm going to show you a picture, Dr. Keith. I think we're going to flash on the screen for the audience, and I want you to share with the audience what that picture means to you. Oh, my goodness. Well, it means two things to me. One <coughs> is that I was a heck of a lot younger. <laughs> younger. <laughs> and the other was th this was the. <clears throat> installation of the president, of my presidency. And uh, the gentleman on the, on the left was one of our board members, Dr. Frank York Lee, and the gentleman in the, the center was the provost of, uh, I believe it was Loyola Mar Marymount University where we held the inauguration. And, uh, and the guy on the right was standing there stiff <laughs> because <laughs> because he, I could see I could see the steam coming out of his head right now, <laughs> and he's thinking to himself, "What the hell have I done?" <laughs> and that's that's a normal type of a feeling that one would have when you're facing a challenge. Fear, right? You spoke of fear, fear earlier. Right, right. Trust, fear. You know, regard to leadership, you have demonstrated and been a role model for all of us here at Western University. Uh, locally and nationally, as well as worldwide. Can you talk about some of the factors that contributed to your success at Western University? Well, I, I think the, 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 the biggest factor that led to uh, the, the successful 
a developer at a university is that I had a core value. I didn't have it just for the summertime or for uh, different seasons, but I had that as an intrinsic part of what I wanted to do and didn't veer from it. I, I kept uh, in touch with it. And uh, many times I was told by people who I uh, trusted, uh, don't do this, you're making a mistake. You can't start an osteopathic medical school back in 1977. Well, fortunately, I, I didn't listen to that. I listened to my wife instead. And we went ahead and, and they built uh, what was then COMP. And uh, in fact, it's, it's important to realize that, that sometimes your biggest supporters are those who are your, who are your, your biggest, uh, what's, what's the, the, the opposite of that? Of somebody who is, mm -hmm. you know, opposed to it. The barrier, yes. The barriers or the opposition. That's probably your biggest advantage. It's your opposition, as long as you don't believe it. Right. I think one of your secret weapons was Mrs. Pomerantz. This is where I'd like you to share the story about traveling back to her hometown, because she was a major part of the success of Western University. You know, as I, I, I said this actually at the graduation the other day, none of us succeed in a vacuum all by ourselves. You've got to have support, no matter how big the project is, you need to have support. Uh, Harriet and I traveled back to her hometown one time <clears throat> uh, while we were back there on a vacation. And as we were driving, she said to me, pull over here into this gas station, which is what I did. I was wondering, what, is, what does she want to pull into the gas station for? Uh, so she ran out of the car and she ran over to the grease monkey and she was uh, friendly with them and so forth and hugging and whatnot. And then she came back into the car and I said, what in the world was that? Why were you getting so friendly with him? She said, oh, when, when we lived here, uh, he was my boyfriend and we were very... <laughs> sure. I said, and she said that we were very, very serious. We were even thinking of, um, of marriage. So I smirked and I said, you know, when she would marry him, if you married him, you'd, you'd be the, the, the wife of uh, Grease Monkey. And, and she said, oh no, dear. If I married him, I would have made him a university president too. <laughs> Story. Yeah. That is my favorite from 1990. That's my favorite. Good. Between uh, 1996 and 2009, you made a bodacious, bold, that we've heard it called many times, move by opening eight additional colleges. At that point, what made you decide to add those colleges to Comp that was already here? Well, it, it made a lot of sense to be able to introduce into the, into the culture, into the setting. Uh, the, the different professions, uh, you know, to teach to heal, to teach to heal together, was was very important, and uh, it, it made sense to be able to bring these colleges uh, here. But that itself was a challenge because there was no guarantee that would uh, work. There was no guarantee there would be support, uh, and, and all the other challenges that I, that I faced. But I think one of the the reasons why we became successful is because the idea was a good one. That made a lot of sense. And it uh, produced an environment that was rich in, in diversity, academic, intellectual, scientific diversity. It was one of, one of the best decisions uh, we ever made. You know, I, go, I know that growth is important to you. Um, can you talk about some of the other historic events over 38 years that come to memory for you? There's a lot I know. Where would I start? Uh, come to come to work. Uh, almost every college that I introduced here uh, had its uh, uh, people who didn't support it, had its opposition yes. for one reason or another. And the thrilling thing for me and my friends, colleagues, was that we overcame all of the objections and built these schools. 
And right now, these nine schools are among the top in the health professions. Uh, the re results that the curriculum achieves for us are absolutely extraordinary. And we know that our students in all of these programs, you know, even though there may be some uh, uh, weaknesses here and there, which are always overcome, we, we built uh, outstanding, an outstanding culture, an outstanding education environment, and built as a result of that a wonderful international reputation. But we're going to continue. We have to continue that. And we just can't stop and, as they say, it rests on our laurels. The laurels are too, uh, sometimes they're, they're too choppy to uh, rest on. So where do you see Western View in the next, say, 100 years? Where do you see, none of us will be here, but you know, where do you see us going? Well, we may be here in another forum. <laughs> I, I think Western University is going to continue to be a leader in, uh, in, in the healing arts. It's going to continue to find new ways uh, to, to function, new ways to teach, to, new ways to structure a curriculum. Uh, it's going to be in a position to be able to uh, try, try to change the past. You know, the, the, the health education in all the professions really hasn't changed in the last hundred years. Now it's up to us, or up to our successors, to, to make a big difference. To make a big difference in that. You know, the term humanism lives daily in us here at Western U, and that core value has been put out to the rest of the world, and some have embraced it. Can you tell me how you came up with that core value of humanism and what it exactly means? Core value of humanism. You wouldn't be surprised if I told you it came from my mother. As a kid, I grew up with that, uh, that belief that I had to care for people. She showed me how to care for people. Uh, and we, like a lot of uh, families in the, after the Depression era, mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of challenges we had to overcome. And through her leadership and guidance, that became part of my, uh, my DNA, I think. You know, in fact, my DNA is out there on the hall somewhere. Yes, it is. And although, like, yeah. the, you were just on the wallpaper right outside this building. Yeah, don't use it to try to fix a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have some um, graduates call in to speak with you shortly. So we're going to listen to our live music for just a minute. They will call in, and we will answer their questions. Good. Thank you. Dr. Pomerantz. Hello. It's Bill Chow calling. Billy. One of your earlier academic students when we first started in 1978. Yes, I'm here. I remember you very well. As I do many of the uh, charter class of the uh, 36 students who took in the Anyone graduated? But okay. That was a special class for us. I used to take. Okay, so I, should I hang up or just stay on the line? Well, congratulations. Which, which is I, I'm sorry. Did we, Billy? Are you there? Well, Dr. Bill Chow is the. Um, I'm still here. Very, very successful uh, dermatologist. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I, I wanted to congratulate you. Thank you, Bill. I hope we see you again real soon. On this milestone, um, and I want to thank you for.
for starting the school that allowed me to further my career. Well, Billy, in your career, you, you, you cared for thousands of people, and you brought health care to those people. You made a major impact, and I'm very proud of you. And I think Actually, you have Dr. Hay. Dr. Muran should have called in on another line. <laughs> Oh, why do you get right? Right? That oh, his sister, Joan, was in the charter class, correct? Is she on the line? Sorry? It's Dr. Haight here. Is that who you want? <laughs> yeah. Dr. Like Joan Haight. Uh, Dr. Pomerantz, can you hear me? I can, Joan. I don't. I, can you tell me if you can hear me or not? I'm not sure. No, I, I can hear you. Oh yeah, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Pomerantz. I just I can't believe this is actually happening because we all look at you as the penultimate ever ready bunny that is never going to stop. So I'm amazed that you're retiring. Hey, well, well somebody had to do it. <laughs> 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 well, some of the story, I listened to your uh, prior part of the conference here, and you told some great stories about comp. I have nothing but great memories, but you forgot about the part where we were huddled on the floor in the old housewares department with blankets. So I had to bring that up because it was a really good bonding experience for the 36 of us. I am one of four women in that class. so. You were always our lead dog. You always will be our lead dog. And you taught us courage and perseverance and you're such an amazing role model. We can't thank you enough for all the sacrifice that you gave in starting this school. And I don't know how to say thank you when thank you is just not enough. I mean, looking at that J.C. Penney building, we were all, we thought, what? And across the street, there was Ed's Greasy Spoon, where we had coffee and sandwiches. And that was the university for us at that time. But it was amazing. We've all grown and prospered and done well and have been able to interact with some great uh, doctors around the country and around the world. And that is all because of you. You changed so many lives. And there's no way we can thank you enough. And as I look at Mrs. Pomerantz, she was always just the driving force, and I'm glad you told that story, because I tell the same story to my husband now, but he's not buying it, so. <laughs> um, we, we just look forward to seeing you around, and our 40th is coming up pretty soon, and I know you'll still be the lead dog for us at that time. You've left an indelible mark on health care and built a powerful institution legacy, and we thank you so much, Dr. Pomerantz. Thank you, Johnny, for those nice thoughts. Remember, though, that <clears throat> your success was based upon you, not just me. You you made it happen in your career and, <clears throat> and in the lives of yeah. your patients. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Pomerantz of Wadi Murat. Uh, I'm also uh, from the class of 84 of COMP, and I think I can speak on behalf of all comp and Western alumni in saying this. You have been an inspiration to us all. Your dream or dreams have allowed many of us to reach and achieve our dream or dreams. For without your dream, ours may not have been reached or accomplished. You have and will continue to have influence on the health care of many for generations to come. We thank you for that. Your wisdom and guidance over the years, and not just while we attended school, has been and continues to be an inspiration. I hope you'll be able to continue to guide and inspire us through your newsletters, even in the retirement. It is with tremendous admiration and respect I thank you, sir, for all that you have done for me and for us. 
The practice of medicine is a commitment to a lifelong occupation and generally not thought of as one that you retire from. I would say your commitment to the DO community and Western U has similarly been a lifelong commitment in which I really don't see you retiring from either. Comp and Western has been around long enough now that some of Comp and Western's alumni also face the prospect of retirement. My question for you is this. As you approach this milestone, what words of wisdom and guidance can you impart to us that look forward to our own future and to that of the osteopathic profession? Thank you, Dr. and Mrs. Pomerantz, and best wishes to you in your retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I appreciate the kind words. Very important. What I'm not going to do in retirement is redo my garage again. <laughs> You know, I will still stay on as President Emeritus and will uh, participate wherever I can be useful and helpful. What about the next leader of Western University? What values would you like to see them bring to our table? Who? The next leader of Western University. What values? You sent us an email a while back addressing some of that. Can you share that with the audience again? I think the next leader should bring some fresh new ideas and, and uh, his or her own courage to the challenges in the future. And, and hopefully that uh, the, the next leader will be in a position to, uh, you know, have, have breakfast with me uh, once a month and that uh, I'd love to be able to keep track of what's going on. Uh, I, I hate to say it quite this way, but this the university feels as though it's a, uh, a large part of, of me, and I don't want to take too much possession of it, but I'd like to be in touch with it. Absolutely. You have a new office in Anderson Tower, so I'm sure we'll see you on campus. Well, we're, we're working at it. Yeah. I'll, I'll be on campus, uh, sure. You know, I was just thinking recently I was at a, a university visiting for some accreditation issues, and the president of that university said to me, you know, your president, being the founding president of Western University, is very audacious and bold. He opened up the patient care center. He opened up a campus up in Lebanon. You know, what made him be the driver of that course? What, what was his rationale for that? But talk to us a little bit about the Conference, Conference Northwest campus. Well, the Con Northwest campus was an extension of everything we try to do here. The same philosophy, the same core values, the same drive. And what the Dean Crone has done, which I'm, I'm very proud of, is she surrounded herself uh, from, with some very fine educators, uh, physicians, and uh, staff people and so forth. It's a wonderful, wonderful group. And uh, they will follow in the footstep of all of our faculty here and our leadership. And uh, they're an integral part of, of Western University. And the future will be more of that. I think we'll see that uh, our university will expand, will grow, will continue to develop its, its reputation and uh, it will provide many more opportunities uh, for students to go out and be healers. You've always been known as a student advocate, as a dean. I've had conversations with you about students and you've always taken the student side over the dean side and I get that. Um, <laughs> can you share with the audience why students are your passion? Yeah, I, I think we're here for students. That's the reason why we, we exist. That's the reason why we do all the things we do. That's the reason why we charge high tuition. <laughs> It's, it's our students that, that count. And uh, so, of course, I advocate for them. And also, I try to be honest with them if I feel that uh, they need another perspective. Uh, it's just natural that I'm student-oriented. And I'd say most of us are as well. You know, I was thinking, too, when I first came to um, Western, this course is not what it is today, but some of the buildings had great significance. Can you talk a little bit about what buildings were which department stores and now they are? You, you know, I, I wish I could, but I can't remember some of that. Uh, <laughs> I, I know there was a major department store down the street here called uh, uh, Buffums. And Buffums then was like Nordstrom's as today. It was a very fine place. And uh, when, when uh, we had the opportunity, uh, I took it over and it became 
Uh, what is it now? Buffalo's is the. Is now the pharmacy. So now where pharmacy is. Pharmacy is located there, plus other uh, programs. Uh, this building we're in right now was, is brand new. Uh, it didn't exist. And this is, in fact, this was the, the first of the buildings that came up de novo from scratch. This was not a retrofit. Yes. And most of the other campuses are retrofit. Uh, J.C. Tenney, which is down the street, was one of our first buildings for classrooms. In fact, the PA program spent a lot of, a lot of time there. And I'm thinking around the campus, what are the other buildings? I can't remember them all. And that, that's the true sign of being retired, is you can't remember some of that stuff. I think people are quite impressed when they come to our campus and they come inside and they go, we had no idea all of this was here. You know, when we started uh, P in 1990, the community was somewhat ready for uh, the development of locations because conflict kind of paved the way for us. What was the community like when you started here? Well, I think the community was uh, made up of uh, uh, many different uh, many different elements. Uh, there were those old guard uh, residents who were surprised that a medical school would be coming to their community. Others were surprised that we were going to be in a position uh, to uh, take away business and uh, maybe affect their businesses. The city council was concerned about uh, not providing uh, tax income because we were a nonprofit, so forth. But as uh, the years went by, uh, all those elements of the community uh, blended in very well and became very supportive. So we have a very, very uh, supportive, a very connected uh, town and gown relationship. You know, uh, Obamacare is, is always a hot topic. And how do you think Western U is positioned to be able to um, increase quality health care and provide access? Well, uh, I think the thing that's going to be important for us is to go beyond the thought that we're a teaching institution. We're a teaching, we're a, a caregiving institution. We're uh, a community of healers, scholars, researchers, and so forth. And so people are recognizing the important contribution this university is making not only to the, this community of Southern California, but throughout, throughout the world. You know, the, the research activities taking place uh, in our colleges under the leadership of our deans and uh, other scholars is absolutely extraordinary. And uh, so Western University is a, a truly an academic and a, uh, a caregiving institution. So where do you see us headed next? We've got the patient care center, we've got all of our academic programs that are strong, all accredited, all have great board scores. Where do you see us next expanding into? Well, I think we're, we're going to ensure that all of that continues. Uh, and one of the things that's going to be very important is that the next president, whoever she or he is, and I, I'm not going to pick him. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll bring a fresh look to the our philosophy. I, I don't think we will lose access to uh, the caring and compassionate nature of this place. Uh, but there got to be new ideas, fresh ideas there for our university. And I'm counting on uh, a um, a president who brings all that type of vitality and views to us. That's why it's important that I not be the, the one selecting who that person is going to be. I would not have do it, as I've written somewhere not too long ago. Uh, but support whoever it will be. And I think we, will, we are leaving to uh, the next uh, president a superb institution that I'd expect the new president to take and propel into the future. In your conversation with he or she, what would be your strongest words of advice? The strongest advice I would give to them is pursue the, the, uh, the humanistic nature of this university. Don't lose that part. Uh, scientific and technical excellence will always be there. I'm, I'm sure our faculty, our students, uh, are, are going to uh, have some very important discoveries that they will make in the teaching. Uh, of, of science and technology, but more importantly, 
I think they need to uh, concentrate on relationships, like caring with each other. That, that, that's, I think, is really important. I'm sure the deans would support that. Uh, you announced your retirement this September. What are your plans? We know you're going to be President Emeritus. You have your office on campus. But outside of that, what do you plan to do? I, I think I'm going to uh, take the first couple of days of retirement just to kick back. And, uh, <laughs> may, maybe, uh, I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. It'll, it'll be something uh, of interest, I hope. And I'll let you know when we get to that point. <laughs> you know, I can't expect too much. Uh, even though I'm a little older than I was last time, and my, my, my age jumps in, in increments of 10, you know, 10 years, 10 <laughs> years. And so I'm, I'm getting up there. So look young. You look exactly the same as when the day I started. Really? Exactly the same. <laughs> he does. He does. He looks exactly the same. Right. That's very, that's very sweet. I'm going to take true. that home and share that with, with Harry. That's just... His hair was the same white. I remember a story we were um, having university orientation and the president and I were sitting next to each other and his hair was sticking up in the back. And Harry said to me, <laughs> okay, what am I going to do? But if Harry gives an order, as the president has stated, we all do it. And so I slid over closer to him and I took my hand and I rubbed his hair down. We made sure <laughs> that the president's hair looked exactly as it does right now because she didn't want his hair to be messed up in his pictures. So there you go. That's, in my, that's one of my other favorite Harriet stories. <laughs> You know, we have a worldwide audience today. We have our local here, and we have a worldwide audience. Um, what are some advice or just words of wisdom or encouragement you'd like to share with us all and, and take your time with it? Well, I can't take my time with it. I may not have that much uh, left of that, but, <laughs> but the, uh, the best piece of advice I could give to uh, children, grandchildren, colleagues, students, is if you believe in something, stay with it. Don't let forces stop you. Don't let challenges back you up. Go after it if you believe it. And the biggest advice you could get from anyone else would be to uh, constantly explore who you are and where you're going to go. But don't don't uh, be discouraged by it challenges that are out there. And who provided you with that advice? Harry or your mom? Well, I think a combination. My mother and, uh, uh, and my wife, uh, I did. You know, like a lot of young men, uh, my wife didn't actually hit it off with my mother to start with. <laughs> but at the end of my mother's uh, life, uh, she became uh, very close to uh, Harry and vice versa as though they were really, you know, you know mother and child. So <clears throat> both of them are powerful, uh, powerful. Me. In fact, my doctoral dissertation is dedicated to my, my mother. So it's to my first teacher. You know, I had another question I thought about was alumni. I know you've had the opportunity to be treated by alumni. What's that like to walk into the emergency room or to the physical therapy clinic and there's one of your graduates? Well, it says to me the decision I made back in 1977 was the correct one. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very touched uh, when I recognize that many of my graduates are our physicians. Uh, Harriet's uh, physician is uh, one of our outstanding uh, graduates, one of the, my neurosurgeons is uh, one of my alums, and so forth. But I think that's one of the advantages that a teacher has, is that you can look back, you can look back on your career and you say, that was one of my students. And maybe I made a difference for him in his life and in the life of the people he, he connected. So alumni is what we're all here for, students. 
and alumni and, and uh, the community because these these graduates are going to care for that community and that's what we ultimately do here we're going to create we're going to create uh, opportunities to uh, enrich and uplift this place absolutely well, audience can i can you join me in thanking dr pomerantz for his remembrance today We'd like to once again uh, thank Dr. Boland for being our interviewer today, and thank Dr. Pomerantz for his time. Um, if, if we could have uh, members of the administration stay behind, those of you who can, to get some photos with Dr. Pomerantz, and others who might like to stay for that as well, we'd appreciate it. Thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. This, will be, uh, this is on our YouTube channel, and we'll, and we'll live there, and we'll be using other portions of this uh, for the foreseeable future and other things we do for the university. Thank you all again, and have a good afternoon. Yeah, they're going to stay here come to you for pictures. Stay here. Seven. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Right. You. What an inspiration you are in your right. life. And your relationship is actually Thank about that. So, I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Get the mic off of you. Is that okay? It's done. All right. Good stick. Sure, right? Yeah, good. Good. We're going to have a lot of good stuff. Go ahead.
talk to Bill Beats. Yeah, sure. I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you. Are you, are you part of the same program? Yeah, uh, we are, yeah, we met where um, I started my doctorate in Florida. So that's where we met. Very nice. <laughs> She has more notes than you have. What's that? More notes? <laughs> oh, she's much better than I am, that's why. <laughs> she... I was out there and I was listening going, oh, no, that's fine. That is fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 